folks, welcome to another set of Chemistry 2 video notes. Today we're going to cover the last half of Chapter 8, which discusses some special types of reactions beyond what we learned in the last video. We're going to talk about the solubility of compounds and what precipitation reactions are, and you'll get a brief introduction into acid-base reactions and chemical synthesis. Let's get started. A precipitation reaction is one in which you mix two or more aqueous solutions of ions together, and produce a new, insoluble compound known as the precipitate. To really understand that definition, we need to know what some of those words mean. If a substance is soluble, it means the substance can dissolve in water. We label it as aqueous for the state symbol when it is dissolved in water. For covalent substances, this means the molecules break away from each other, but they still stay as molecules. Like when you dissolve sugar in water you still have molecules of C6H12O6 floating around in the water, but they're just not stuck together like they were when they were a solid. For ionic substances, which do not exist as distinct molecules but as a crystal lattice structure of ions, they dissociate or split into their separate ions when they're dissolved in water. For example, when you place table salt in water, it splits up into separate Na plus ions and Cl negative ions. They do not exist as molecules of NaCl, because NaCl is a non-molecular substance. When you run across a chemical formula labeled as AQ, you need to recognize that if it's a covalent molecule, that just means the molecules are floating around in water. And you need to recognize that if it's an ionic compound, that means the ions are separated and floating around independently in the water. That's why ionic compounds can conduct electricity when they're dissolved in water. The charged particles floating around allow the electricity to be carried through the solution. To determine if a molecule is soluble or not, you just need to look at this table of solubility rules. I'll provide you with this table on assignment, so you're free to copy it down, but you might not need to. This table tells us which compounds are soluble in water and which are not, with any exceptions listed. To use it, you need to recognize what it's saying. For example, a sodium salt is any ionic compound with sodium as the cation. An acetate or nitrate compound is any ionic compound with the polyatomic ion acetate or nitrate as the anion. This goes back to knowing your polyatomic ions, so maybe go back and study those again. I do want you to memorize the following compounds that are always soluble in water. Any compound with sodium, potassium, or ammonium as the cation will be soluble in water, and any compound with acetate or nitrate as the anion will also be soluble in water. Write those down in your notes and memorize them, as it will save you a whole lot of time in the long run. When you combine two aqueous solutions of ionic compounds, remember those solutions already have the ions separated and floating around in the water, you can form new combinations of cations and anions, or new compounds. For example, if I mix lead nitrate with sodium iodide, I can see in my resulting solution that I now could have lead ions forming ionic attractions to iodide ions, and sodium with nitrate. Those are my two new combinations that I couldn't have before these two solutions were mixed. Now check your solubility rules and see if one of them is insoluble. If there is an insoluble product, it forms a solid and precipitates out of solution. So you have a precipitation reaction. If you mix two solutions of ions together and no precipitate is formed, then you did not have a chemical reaction because the ions don't change. They stay just as they were dissolved in the water. In the case of my reaction here, lead to iodide is a bright yellow insoluble compound, so this is a precipitation reaction. Another important thing to note when doing this is that you have to make sure your ionic charges cancel out. All ionic compounds are neutral, so in the case of my solutions here, my lead 2 plus ions would form a precipitate with two iodide ions, since each iodide ion is only negative one. The ions that don't form a solid don't change. They just stay in the solution. We call these ions spectator ions because they're just watching the other ions without participating in the reaction. There are three ways to represent our precipitation reactions. The normal balanced equation that you're used to, the complete ionic equation, and the net ionic equation. The normal equation shows all of our ionic compounds as intact using their molecular formulas. The aqueous state symbol tells us that they actually exist as ions, so it is accurate, but it's kind of a shorthand way of writing it. The complete ionic equation separates all of those aqueous compounds into their ions, 
It gives us a more complete picture of what's happening in the reaction and is a good starting point for finding our net ionic equation. Notice it is still balanced. One important difference is that instead of PbNO3 2 with that 2 outside of the parentheses, since these are split up into separate ions, we say there are two NO3 negatives. To find the net ionic equation from here, we just cross out the spectator ions, or the ones that are the same on both sides. This gives us a really shorthand picture of which ions are actually reacting to form our precipitate. Here's a really good summary of the steps you should follow to determine if your reaction is a precipitate reaction and what to do if it is. Next up, let's talk about acids and bases. Acids are any compound that produce hydrogen ions in water. These compounds might include some edible acids, like citric acid that's responsible for the sourness of certain fruits and all sour candies, acetic acid, which is vinegar, or ethers. Some inedible acids are sulfuric acid, which is found in car batteries, hydrochloric acid, which is used to clean steel, or nitric acid, which is used to dissolve metals. The one thing these all have in common is that they have a negative ion like sulfate, chloride, phosphate, or nitrate attached to at least one H plus ion. When they dissolve in water, they split up into their ions, giving us some H plus in our water. For now, an OK definition for a base is any compound that produces hydroxide ions, or OH negative. Things like sodium hydroxide, which is lye, potassium hydroxide, or calcium hydroxide, will all split up into some hydroxide ions when they're put into water. When you mix an acid and a base together, say hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, you end up with more water molecules and an aqueous solution of your spectator ions. The net ionic equation for this reaction is H plus plus OH negative gives us H2O. This means that Na and Cl are our spectator ions. What we end up with is the same solution we would get if we just dissolved sodium chloride in water. Anytime an acid-base reaction occurs, some neutralization occurs, or the H pluses react with the OH negatives and cancel each other out. This is why we sometimes call it an acid-base neutralization reaction. When you have just as many hydrogen ions as you do hydroxide ions, they all completely cancel each other out, and that's when you end up with a neutral solution, or one with a pH of 7. Last up for today is chemical synthesis. You're getting a very, very small taste of what this is, only to serve as a motivation for why chemical reactions are so gosh darn important. Chemical synthesis is the work behind planning, performing, and perfecting the preparation of a new compound. Sometimes this can be done in one step, sometimes it takes many steps. You often have to isolate certain compounds from mixtures and purify them along the way. There are a whole lot of reaction mechanisms that someone in an organic chemistry class will memorize, but for now, let's just focus on one example. You always have a goal compound in mind, in this case, 1-bromobutane. My organic chemistry knowledge tells me that if I add hydrobromic acid to a double-bonded hydrocarbon, that H and the Br add themselves to the carbons that are a part of that double bond. So I know that's a good reaction to get a Br onto one of my carbons. So now I've got to pick a starting reactant. Both of these reactants are readily available commercially, so I could pick either one. If I add HBr to the first one, I could end up with a Br on carbon 1 or on carbon 2, so that might be a viable option. If I use the second reactant here, the Br would add to either carbon 2 or carbon 3, but I want it on carbon 1. So this one is not an option. Now, say I added my HBr to the 1-butene molecule. I could end up with Br on carbon 1 or carbon 2. Both of those are equally as likely. So maybe that's how I do my reaction. I just end up throwing half of my product away because it's not what I want, and I have to isolate this one away from that. Or, since I know a little bit more about organic chemistry, I could mix my HBr with something called a peroxide, which is another reagent that helps in these reaction mechanisms. And that peroxide will force the bromine to only attach to the carbon 1, giving me a really good product and a lot better yield. So now again, this is just a little taste into chemical synthesis. My goal is that you recognize how important chemical reactions are and why we need to learn about them as chemists. The more we know about our reactions and how they work, the better we can be at forming new compounds that better our world. Well, that's all for today, folks. I hope this video was helpful. I would definitely read these three sections from your book as well. As always, if you have any questions, let me know.